Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Welcome to the latest episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series. Today's topic is debt limit deal and other legislative developments. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. With that, I'll send it over to our presenters, Marty Ross and Kathy Reap. Thanks, Shannon. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Flag Day 2023 um, to talk about the goings on in Washington, D.C. Although Kathy and I generally limit ourselves to the regulatory world, um, what is cooking up in Washington certainly will have a significant impact on what we see in regulation um, over the next several months and even years. So we're going to take a slight diversion today and talk about first the debt uh, limit deal, the well, officially the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, and then dive into some legislation that is running through Congress right now, um, some legislation that has been reported out of the House Energy and Commerce Bill, at least one of which appears to be on a fast track to um, adoption. Uh, so certainly something for providers to be aware. Uh, but let's talk So let's talk about what's already happened, the debt deal, the, FIS, the FRA, and of course the question is why are these two men smiling? Um, and how did they get this deal done? Because when you look at the vote totals um, from both the House and the Senate on the FRA, the, the bill that approved the debt ceiling and included compromises to accomplish that, um, you appreciate that neither party could have passed this bill alone in either House. It truly took a meeting in the middle um, to pass this critical legislation. I am not going to once again talk about the risks associated with breaching the debt ceiling, what it could have done to the economy. We have avoided that now, at least through January of 2025. Instead, let's talk about the compromise. And in the words of my great hero, Tyron Lannister, no one is happy, which means it must be a good compromise. We'll see, um, at least in terms of the provider community, this is a great compromise because what could have really been some significant hits on provider payments uh, appear to have been avoided in this legislation. Um, So, of course, the key, the big headline you've been reading in the papers is that we've suspended the federal debt limit through January of 2025. So actually, it didn't increase the debt limit. We just suspended the debt limit. Uh, But then uh, as of January 2nd of that year, that should be a five, not a 24. It should be January 2nd, 2025. Uh, So you get for not reading the slides closely enough, but at that point, the debt ceiling will be increased to accommodate whatever spending occurred during the suspension period. So it is a kick the can down the road as it always is with the debt ceiling. At some point in time, maybe we'll have the legislative votes to eliminate the debt ceiling, um, as does every other industrialized country, but this is where we are today. Um, What uh, the Republicans were able to extract in exchange for the agreement on the debt ceiling were new discretionary spending limits for fiscal year 24 and 25. And those are enforced with sequestration, meaning if they do not meet those requirements as they complete the budgets for 24 and 25, uh, will go to automatic spending cuts across the board um, to enforce those new limitations on spending. Uh, We provided statutory authority through 2024 for administrative pay-as-you-go rules. We'll discuss that in a minute. Um, We rescinded certain unobligated COVID-19 relief dollars as well as IRS funds. Uh, And we'll do a much deeper dive on that in just a minute. Uh, We ended the suspension of federal student loan payments. We expanded some work requirements in federal welfare programs. um, And we allowed for expedited permitting in certain energy projects. Um, On the plus side, um, there were agreements to fund the VA's cost of war toxic exposure fund, as well as some funding for the Department of Commerce's non-reoccurring expense fund. As you look at FRA, think of it as this is the effectively the continuing resolution for 2023. This is the budget deal uh, for 2023, which places restrictions then 
on budgeting in 2024 and 2025. But as you said, Marty, we're merely kicking the can down the road. Exactly, kicking the can down the road. Um, if, as you look at that list, and I'll go back, um, think of what's not there. Um, think of no changes to any sort of non-discretionary spending, i.e. Medicare and Medicaid. Um, think about other potential cuts that could have been made in, that would have impacted providers negatively. They're not there. But let's talk about the, the, the limits on discretionary spending. Um, the idea here is in 24 and 25, uh, Congress has created a, a sandbox in which it must play. Um, it says we can only spend up to these amounts on both non-defense and defense-related discretionary spending. Um, so you see there in the graphic uh, what those spending levels are in 2023 and what the limits will be in 24 and 25. 96% of these uh, limits impact non-defense spending. There's only 4% an impact on the, on the defense spending side. Um, there are certain discretionary programs that have been exempted from these limits, such as disaster relief, some of the programs that were created under the 21st Century Cures Act, um, as well as the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Um, so they are not going to be part of these limits. Appreciate, back to Kathy's theme of kicking the can down the road, they're not telling us what programs are going to be cut and to what level. They're just saying, this is the starting point. It is up now to the committees and Congress as a whole to decide which programs are going to get what money. Um, and so certainly there's some wranglings back and forth we will experience um, with the 24 and 25 budget. Um, the idea here, um, again, there's also a incentive built in to kind of force Congress to do budgeting. Um, but if they do not, um, complete the budgets for each of the budget accounts. They, in fact, instead go to the continuing resolution game of just the same money moving forward. Um, if they do not complete the, that budgeting process each year, those discretionary spending limits actually go down even further. So they built in this incentive to actually do the work in those appropriations. Um, the enforcement, as we mentioned previously, is sequestration, uh, meaning that um, across the board reductions for all non-exempt spending if we don't meet those discretionary targets. Um, what the uh, Congressional Budget Office will tell you is that this is intended to reduce non-interest outlays in the federal budget by $1.3 trillion over 10 years. That projection is dependent on Congress in 2026 using that 2025 as the baseline for budgeting. Um, they don't have to do that. And Congress can decide in 2026, those were two years, they were anomaly, we reduced spending in those two years, but we're actually gonna start budgeting based on 2023 numbers increased for inflation. So there's no guarantee on that 1.3 trillion over 10 years. Instead, what we know is going to happen is the $246 billion reduction as compared to baseline expenditures for the current year. Marty, when you said on that slide sequestration, Mm -hmm. uh, that is, we currently have a 2% sequestration. We've got potential sequestration coming in in another year or two, uh, expanded under PAYGO. So this would be okay. even more on top of what we have. This is a third version of sequestration because we have the original sequestration from the Budget Act that gives us the 2% we have today. <laughs> we have the pending 4% that we see at the beginning of 25 right now 25, I think. Down to 25. Um, so this would be on top of that so we keep saying we're going to pay for Are it you like getting the good news? Uh, I am getting I'm getting to the good news well here we go federal yes. health care spending um, as you are probably well aware 29% uh, of federal outlays in 2023 are related to health care programs and you see that uh, comparison in that first graph on the left um, but of that um, federal spending on health care, 88% is non-discretionary because that is the Medicare, Medicaid program. Um, it is that other 12% um, that is potentially on the line for these cuts we will see in 23 and 24. Um, see here, um, the distinct, how we distinguish between mandatory and discretionary spending on health care. Um, obviously, Medicare makes up the majority of that spending. Medicaid is not far behind, but then we also have CHIP as well as ACO premium supports. All of those go into the budget, not impacted by this deal. 
are impacted by the sequestration. We know that, but for this deal, they are not impacted by these spending limits. On the other side, you see how that other 12% is spent. The majority goes to the VA. I would think it's safe to assume no one's going to be very excited about cutting the VA budget, um, at least their healthcare budget. So does these other programs we're looking at um, that will be part of the discussion over the next two years as Congress navigates those budget limits. Um, beyond the discretionary spending limits, briefly on administrative PAYGO. This has been around for a while. In fact, OMB implemented administrative PAYGO in 2005. This is the idea that if you, as a federal, if you have a federal agency propose a regulation that's going to result in increased spending, you have to propose a corresponding provision that will reduce dollars equally. So kind of think about statutory PAYGO. This is in the context of administrative regulations. Um, in 2019, President Trump issued an executive order that was intended to institutionalize and reinvigorate administrative PAYGO. But again, the limitations there was that it was contained within an executive order. So FRI now creates a statutory authority for administrative PAYGO, but with a very narrow window. Uh, this will remain effect, in effect through the end of 2024. Um, we'll be seeing the Office of Management and Budget, which is responsible for, for administrative PAYGO. They are required to issue guidance on how this will be implemented by the beginning of August. Um, and so it is yet to see exactly how this will impact rulemaking. Uh, as you know, we closely watch rulemaking within CMS. They have some upcoming rules uh, that most likely will be published after August. Uh, particularly around the No Surprises Act, um, and then the, the number of regulations tied to what's now pending legislation in Congress. So this is sort of a wait and see. It's just another complication in our rulemaking process of which you should be aware. The other key provision that impacts providers um, in, the federal, in the Fiscal Responsibility Act is the COVID relief clawback provisions. Um, as you know, and as we've talked about over the last three years, there, there are billions and billions of dollars um, appropriated by Congress to federal agencies to assist um, with the national COVID recovery. Um, it went to a number of different funds, the ones of which near and dear to our hearts have been the Pandemic Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Um, which is which which lives on the federal budget in the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. Um, of the dollars that have been appropriated um, to that fund, the clawback um, in the legislation is $10.4 billion. So that's now no longer available to HRSA. Uh, because it is now back into the big pile of money to be uh, spent. The total amount that's clawed back is about $30 billion. Uh, but again, only about a third of that is coming out of health care. It's other programs that have been impacted by the clawback as well. So when you talk about the Pandemic Health and Social Services Fund, what's left there now? Um, there are certain prior appropriations that were exempt from the clawback. The CARES Act, there's about $2.1 billion, as well as some additional transfers that were left in the fund. They were not clawed back. Uh, the other funding source for the fund um, was the American Rescue Plan in 2021. Um, of the dollars appropriated that, uh, that remain, um, 7.3 billion is not been, uh, it remains, it has not been clawed back. Now, you can read the regular, the statutory text. There is no direction from Congress on how those remaining dollars are to be spent. What you'll find instead are some press reports that say the intention behind those reserved funds were for high priority projects like next generation vaccines, test procurement, um, long COVID research, other priorities. But there is no statutory provision, um, at least at this point, that directs how those dollars are going to be, how those dollars are going to be handled. The other part of the story is that there are still dollars coming back to the fund. That means funds that have been repaid by providers, the Provider Relief Fund, 
or even um, through enforcement action is being recovered from recipients of those funds in return. Now, the statutory text in these early pieces of legislation that appropriated these dollars said that those dollars recovered back were to be reinvested in the fund for continued COVID relief. But at this point, we're not even sure how much money is there at this point. Um, so soon after uh, the FRA became law, if you went to the HRSA Provider Relief Fund website, you saw this program update in bold letters um, for June 23. And it's HRSA telling us, uh, because all of the dollars have been clawed back from us, um, we no longer can make payments through the Provider Relief Fund um, or the American Rescue Plan Rural Distribution. There will be no more reconsideration payments. Um, and there will be no more dollars available for the uninsured program or the coverage assistance program. It is black and white, according to HRSA, where things stand today. But let's talk, let's go a little deeper. Let's talk about the uninsured program. Now, if you remember, this was um, HRSA allocating a portion of the fund um, to provide reimbursement to providers who furnished COVID-19 vaccination, testing, and treatment for individuals who are uninsured. And by its own language, HRSA says that this was intended to prevent the spread of the pandemic because we wanted providers, we wanted to encourage providers to ensure that, uninsured, to ensure that uninsured individuals had access uh, to these critical services. So we were going to pay you for it. I'm sure many of the folks who are on the webinar today went through the enrollment process, agreed to the terms and conditions and submitted claims. But there's still some unanswered questions here. And so wisely on our part, we're going to turn this over to some real experts about the UIP. Uh, please introduce, we'd love to introduce our friends, Brian Stinson and Don Helak, who are attorneys with McDermott, Will and Emory. And now at this point, I am just going to advance slides for you. So Brian and Don, take it over. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate the, the warm introduction. And it's good to be with everybody today. Um, the UIP and, and the Provider Relief Fund are issues near and dear to our hearts. They're kind of passion projects for us, which sounds like an oxymoron, <laughs> but they are. Uh, I'm a partner in uh, in the McDermott Health Group in DC. I was previously the number two lawyer at HHS and have been collaborating with Dawn on issues related to both programs for some time now. Um, I'll allow Dawn to, to introduce herself and, and dive into the UIP. Thanks, Brian, and, and thanks again, Kathy and uh, and Marty. Um, I'm Don Helak. I'm also a health partner in McDermott's DC office. I've spent my career working with providers on health M&A, transactional, and regulatory matters. Uh, and over the last several years, as Brian mentioned, I've been working with uh, scores of clients across provider types and geographies on PRF and, and UIP matters. Uh, just spanning the, the life of the pro those programs. Um, on the slide here, you know, as Marty mentioned, the the UIP program um, was formed after Congress appropriated COVID funds to HHS, uh, and the agency created the uninsured program in early 2020 as a matter of, of contract. Uh, under the, the UIP terms and conditions, uh, HERS agreed to reimburse providers as, at Medicare rates in exchange for providing the treatment, uh, testing vaccines to those uninsured patients. And a lot of this was at the, the behest of both the Trump and Biden administrations asking providers to, to jump in, save the day, and provide these needed services to the uninsured. Fast forward, uh, in mid-March 2022, uh, HRSA announced the termination of the program uh, and gave providers only a week, really, to submit claims uh, for outstanding services under the, the program, which left uh, many providers with millions in unpaid UIP claims for services that they legitimately provided under the program in reliance on the uh, uh, on reliance on those contracts. Um, meanwhile, HRSA actually uh, continued to process the PRF payments and pay UIP claims that were submitted prior to the deadline. Uh, you know, as, as Marty mentioned, the FRA rescinds a lot of the unobligated HHS COVID relief funding, but it reserves billions to the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Um, and while some information, some public information suggests that HHS has a plan to use the reserve funds, 
those funds still haven't been obligated. Uh, they are available for UIP and, and PRF. Um, and also, of course, there's the additional funds that continue to come in to that to that fund uh, under either providers returning payments or uh, the recoupment process through HRSA, uh, HHS, HRSA, or, or otherwise. Um, so, you know, we believe that uh, a contract was formed when the providers enrolled in the program um, and that HHS should stand behind the, its uh, obligations under the, that contract. Um, in addition, there are, and just as a, a footnote here, um, there are other providers that have uh, continued to provide free services under uh, vaccine provider uh, participation agreements with the CDC um, and, and may be, uh, you know, that's beyond the, the UIP program as well, but uh, also creates uh, problems for providers. Brian, do you want to talk us through the, the PRF dynamics sure. as well? Sure. I'd add on the on the UIP, our, um, our view is that, as Dawn said, a contract was formed when it, whenever a provider enrolled in the program. Um, if you have a contract that forms an obligation under the public fiscal laws. And so the funds that were obligated through those contracts should not even be touched by the rescissions in the first instance. They should be available still to pay those contractual obligations. And that's before you even get to the reserve funds and the recoupments, which go back into the, the accounts at HHS when they're recouped. Um, the situation with the PRF is is equally confounding, uh, but slightly different. Um, the PRF, as everybody knows, uh, involved multiple phases. Uh, each phase involved an application, and then there was a reconsideration process, and we worked with a lot of providers to seek reconsideration and, and do so collaboratively with the agency. And now the agency has said, too bad, so sad. There, there's no more reconsideration process. We're ending that. And regardless of whether you have a pending application and regardless of whether you have a pending reconsideration request and regardless of whether you're, you've been playing ball with us, you're not getting any anything, period. Um, that is surprising uh, because as Marty pointed out, Congress reserved unobligated funds uh, substantial amount of unobligated funds without limitation on use such that the original appropriating laws would set the only boundaries for the use of the funds. Um, HRSA can change its policies. Uh, the law allows them to do that, but there are limits to what HRSA can do. And those limits are laid out in a series of Supreme Court cases. HRSA can uh, change its policy, announce the change, state good grounds for the changes, and then take into account the reliance interests of affected parties uh, who were, who counted on the, the, the pre-existing policy. Uh, and, and our view is that in this situation, HRSA announced a policy change without providing good grounds, meaning without explaining why it couldn't use the reserve funds to continue the reconsideration process. And without accounting for the reliance of all the providers who participated in the reconsideration process, thinking they were going to get a fair shake, um, we we think that that is a real deficiency uh, in the conduct of the agency. We think that it is actionable. We think that providers have a compelling story to tell, and we've gone up against HRSA in connection with the PRF before and succeeded. We actually brought a lawsuit last month against HRSA and negotiated a settlement with DOJ that netted $43 million for one of our uh, hospital clients. We feel just as strongly about the UIP and the PRF now as we did last month. And so uh, wanna talk a little bit about some next steps that we'd like everyone on the webinar to consider. Um, as I said, we think this situation's unfair to providers, and we think providers have really compelling arguments. We're gonna be hosting a registration-only webinar 
next Tuesday at 3 p.m. to talk about some opportunities for seeking relief under both programs, as well as the CDC agreements. Uh, we're going to be posting the registration link in the chat for this uh, this webinar right now. And if you'd like to get the link to the webinar next week, you can email our team, um, Olivia Mole and uh, Madeline Hullahan at the email addresses uh, on the slide. And if you have any questions about any of this, you can email uh, Don or me at our email addresses on the slide, which are also posted on our website. We're happy to talk with anyone directly about this who's interested and thinks that they've been um, have been impacted negatively, and uh, hope you'll you'll join us next week. But uh, Marty and Kathy, uh, in the meantime, thanks for uh, letting us talk about these issues. Yeah, absolutely, and, and Brian, if you could just provide a little bit of context here, um, I'm sure we have some folks on that are listening. They're like, "Well, we had some claims. Yeah, we provided these services. We had claims. They told us that the fund was depleted. So uh, we had claims we submitted. We didn't get paid." Uh, are those the types of claims that we think there's an opportunity for recovery through this type of litigation? Just kind of paint that picture for us. Sure. So the UIP and the PRF are slightly different. Um, the UIP we submit um, involve the creation of contracts. And at a bare minimum, um, there's a compelling argument that when contracts were formed and services were provided, before HRSA ended the program in April of 2022 uh, and stopped accepting claims, uh, any services that were rendered uh, prior to that time give rise, for which no payment was made, give rise to a breach of contract claim, regardless of whether those UIP claims were submitted or not. And we've and, talked to our- Brian, would okay. that include those patients who were already in the hospital? they hadn't been discharged and therefore no claim had been generated or, you know, no bill had been generated because patient was still in-house. Yes, because the government stopped accepting claims, took down the Optum website before those providers had an opportunity to even submit claims. And then counterintuitively, the government continued to pay claims that it had received after saying that it lacked the funds to make any more payments. And then just recently again announced that it was stopping payments, which it had supposedly stopped in April of 2022 and said that the terms and conditions still apply in perpetuity to the providers, at least from the government's perspective. From where we sit, that is a very confusing chain of events. And it suggests that there are still funds available and those funds can be used to pay the government's contractual obligations. Um, the PRF uh, would not involve the formation of contracts. It would be an action to seek relief from the government's policy decision on the grounds that that policy change was arbitrary and capricious. And uh, it would be brought under the Administrative Procedure Act and the relief that would be sought was would be a remand to the agency to reconsider its decision and more specifically to uh, reconsider the applications and reconsideration requests of the providers. Well, Don and Brian, thank you so much for taking a deep dive into this because it is one of those tentacles of the FRA which we need to figure out, make sure Providers are protected and fully compensated. Um, Matthew has posted in the chat um, the link for the webinar registration, the MWE Red webinar, which will go much deeper uh, into this and the potential litigation. Uh, don't worry if you haven't taken a screenshot of the slide right now. Of course, we always send you um, the slide deck after the webinar so that you'll be able to access these email addresses. Um, and Brian and Don certainly can address any deeper questions you have. Don't ask Kathy or me. We're just following along with this, but certainly the experts are available to you. So, right, but if you do put any questions at the end of the webinar in the and the Q and A uh, that are specific to this, we will send them to Don and Brian. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Okay, so let's shift gears significantly. Let's go from legislation that has been signed, sealed, and delivered to what's now going on on Capitol Hill. We're going to talk about those bills on Capitol Hill, and as the Schoolhouse Rock folk remind us, it's a long path forward uh, to get your signature on a bill, but there are two significant pieces of legislation, which, as I referenced previously, have been reported out to the House from the full Energy and Commerce Committee. The first of those is H.R. 3561. Uh, Kathy, I'll just briefly introduce this because I think this is a perfect example of a tortuous acronym because I don't know, increasing extremely needed, I guess that's how you can get the INT uh, for the Patient Act. So back in March, the chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee convened a markup session where they took, I think, 19 different pieces of legislation that were related to healthcare reimbursement um, and glopped them all together and created this bill. Um, 3591 is about 120 pages long, so it's not particularly lengthy. Um, the link to the statutory, the, sorry, the legis the proposed bill text, there we go, is down there at the bottom. It's actually not available on congress.gov. You actually have to get into Energy and Commerce to get it. But if you want to read the specific provisions, you can. Um, and we've identified 10 specific topics of interest to providers that are included within the Patient Act. Um, Kathy's going to provide you a deep dive on the first six, um, but appreciate there is even more in here um, than what we're going to discuss today. The thing to really pay attention to here is the first bullet. It advanced out of the committee on a vote of 49 to zero. So even more surprising than that chart we saw earlier in this, today's webinar on the passage of the FRA, this is a true bipartisan piece of legislation where everyone on the committee agreed to report out the provisions where it is in the bill. So providers need to be following the legislative track of this bill closely. Um, as you see, it's going to have some significant impacts on programs we know today and programs um, that may be in the future. So Kathy, tell us the story. Well, and before you even go off of that slide, one of the things that we aren't going to stress today, and that is the oversight of the pharmacy benefit managers, that has gotten a lot of press. Most of the press off of this bill has been the PBM issue. It hasn't been the transparency, the site neutral issues, things like that. Um, and therefore, we thought it was important that we go ahead and bring to you today these issues that are going to impact day-to-day um, -day operations in hospitals and other types of providers as well. So let's start with hospital price transparency. Haven't we already done that um, is what I want to say. Um, but they are looking at modifying the rules as it relates to price transparency, both in terms of what you report and formats for reporting penalties, et cetera. So the first requirement in this bill is that as of January 2025, anyone who is using a price estimator um, to substitute for the 300 shoppable services list would have to put in place the 300 shoppable services. You can keep your price estimator, which is a great tool for telling the patient what they are going to owe, but the, um, the Law, as if it is finalized by Congress, would require that you also post your shoppable services. If you don't remember, it was 70 services identified by CMS um, and then up to an additional 230 services, assuming that you do um, furnish to uh, 300 distinct shoppable services. This isn't going to be what you charge for an emergency room. This is when I am um, when I'm scheduling a service. That's where I would be shopping. So number one, anyone who has relied on a price estimator, that would have to go away. Um, you could keep it, but you're still going to have to have the shoppable services list. There would also be some um, more standardization of the methodology for reporting the information um, from uh, on the provider's um, websites. Um, it would be standardized, uniform reporting. Unfortunately, we know what that um, was also the words that were used when it came to posting the payer transparency data and it's a mess, um, but mo modifying your current formats 
first of all, all rates would have to be uh, expressed as dollar amounts. This is something that they have allowed you in the past to leave blank, to do things like this. You're going to have to fill every field on those um, on that machine readable file. And this would be a requirement again as of January 2025 if this passes through Congress. Um, for your, you're going to have to include a plain language description of the services being provided and you're going to have to clearly indicate any codes associated with that particular service, whether it be a national drug code, CPT code, uh, HICSPIX code, anything like that, that's going to have to be clearly distinguished and you're going to have to say what kind of code it is, okay? It's not just going to be a bunch of numbers that you can't, uh, you don't, or letters that you can't recognize what it goes to. Um, your gross charge, for both inpatient and outpatient services. So in the past, we have just had a gross charge and um, we have assumed that it was applicable to both settings. Now you're gonna have to clearly delineate whether or not this is inpatient or outpatient charge or both. Um, you're going to have to clearly identify the name of the third party payer and the plan, again, both on an inpatient and an outpatient basis and any, um, negotiated, it says charge, you mean rate, but Congress used the word charge, CMS typically uses the word charge, but they are, you don't negotiate charges, you negotiate rates. Um, but the, la the language in the law is charge. And then finally, you are de-identified minimum and maximum charge, meaning rate, again, uh, similar to what we have now. One thing that is also a new requirement is that your discounted cash price. A lot of providers don't have discounted cash prices and therefore they left that field blank on the machine readable file. You're going to have to re-enter the gross charge if you do not have a discounted cash price. So you're going to be clearly identifying that I don't have a discounted cash price because it goes back to my gross charge. Marty, I saw you want to say something. So, so Kathy, is this good news or bad news for providers? Because I know a lot of the talk about non-compliance with transparency has been around data hasn't been submitted appropriately. So what are your views on that? Um, I think it will eliminate some of those entities that are saying hospitals are not compliant because they aren't reporting correctly or I can't really determine whether this is inpatient or outpatient. They left blanks, they used NAs, things like that. Um, but I think ultimately from a provider perspective, you've got more work to do. And I think as we will see on the next slide, we're gonna have a lot more oversight. Um, moving forward on compliance with the transparency rules. First of all, the both CMS and the Office of Inspector General are going to be required to establish a process uh, internally to regularly monitor the accuracy of the information that has been posted. Um, it took a while as we went through the issue that there were going to be increased penalties to figure out what the increased penalties were, but uh, essentially what they did is for those hospitals with 30 beds or less, we're keeping the penalty as it is now, which is $300 per day. But for those with more than 30 beds, they are lifting as of th this law would lift as of January 1, 2024, the um, cap on the $10 per day. Currently we're dealing with a $5,500 uh, cap. So if you had more than 550 beds, um, your per day penalty would be $5,500. No, um, they are going to lift that with a minimum penalty in place of at least $5 million if you have failed to comply for a year or more. Now, we have, we've only had four hospitals that have been penalized so far, and I think one is actually going to court disputing the penalty that they have um, been um, uh, charged with. You lift the, um, uh, the, the, the cap, the $5,500 cap. If you're non-compliant, your, your rate, if you're more than 550 beds, your penalty is automatically going to go up significantly. Um, and when it says failure to comply for a year or more, I 
get, I start thinking now, who would that be? Nobody is going to fail to comply for a year or more. The issue is you have to keep your files updated at least annually. All right. If I fail to update, and maybe I updated, but I never changed that date on my file. I got a problem because I could be looking at a $5 million penalty at that point. Um, it's, uh, CMS is going to maintain and make publicly available a list of those hospitals to be non-compliant uh, who have received a, correction, uh, uh, a warning letter, a corrective action plan, as well as notification of those hospitals that are currently under review. Uh, an annual report will be submitted by CMS to Congress relate, related to complaints. Uh, they might have found that XYZ Hospital was compliant, but they did receive a complaint about that hospital. Therefore, it is going to have to be reported to Congress. Um, and then um, the GAO is going to be required to also provide a report about um, the uh, any needed improvements related to the price transparency information and um, increasing the civil monetary penalties at $300 a day for small hospitals, $10 a day, et cetera, for the um, larger hospitals. And interesting, and I'm just not sure how you do this, okay, but CMS is going to be tasked with developing requirements for hospitals to use to ensure that your um, price transparency files are easily accessible um, for individuals who have limited English proficiency, whether you use interpretation services to, um, uh, to um, help someone understand the information that's posted, whether you actually wind up having to post in multiple languages, those that are most common within your community. And I start thinking about the terms that are in your charge master and how in the world you do this, um, but recognize that this would be a rule that we would be seeing in the not too distant future in, sure, in terms of ensuring um, those individuals um, uh, who have trouble with English um, have easy access to your files. Um, moving on to the second area um, of, of that was addressed in this law. Um, bill, not, yeah. just a bill. Huh? It's bill, just it's a bill. bill, it's a bill, it's a bill. <laughs> Got to go back to my music. Okay. Hospitals are not alone. Um, we also have the issue of health insurer transparency or payer uh, transparency. We did have the transparency and coverage rules that came about, um, and now this would be imp imposing some additional transparency requirements on the plans. Um, the first is that beginning in January 2025 and every three months at, uh, going forward, they would be able to, they would be required to make information available in a format this, um, defined by CMS um, for each in-network provider identified by the national provider identifier. Currently, some of the information that's posted by the pay payers is done by um, tax number, EIN, um, but this would require in-network rates to be reported by national provider identifier. And then for those um, non-participating providers, the amounts that were billed for service uh, by that provider, as well as the amount that was allowed. Um, so this would be a report that would be coming out very, um, very frequently. Interesting comment on this, I would just put as an aside, that, bill, that amount billed and allowed for each non-participating provider could be very interesting when we then start looking at um, qualifying payment amounts and negotiated rates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it might be a good tool to use if it's not too big of a file to be able to access. Uh, finally, the health plans would be required to publish instructions uh, in plain language on how to use this publicly reported data. And I have a feeling it would also have to be made available in um, or to those with limited English proficiency. Okay, wait up, Kathy, wait, wait, wait. So what have, under these transparency and coverage rules, what have we seen from the plans and how different would this be from what they've done to date? Um, CMS essentially told the plans, this is the format we want you to use. 
Um, the files are massive. I think, Marty, we have shared on previous webinars that the files for one payer um, were greater than the, the data enclosed included there was greater than the file size for what? Library of Com Congress, um, Netflix. Uh, Netflix, and there was one more. Was it Wikipedia? That was Wikipedia, yeah. Okay, uh, for one payer. Uh, this is going to be maybe getting this information down into a little bit more consumer-friendly, usable format. Um, we will see because CMS thought what they created was going to be user-friendly, and it obviously isn't. Yeah, um, I think our partner Turquoise said that just the cost of storing the data that was produced by the payers was over a million dollars a year. That's before yeah. you start doing any type. That's of not data using the data, or you know, it's just storing. storing. It. Yeah. yeah. So okay. um, there are also going to be some required reports for, for the um, payers. And this is, first of all, that the Comptroller General by January of 25 would submit a report to Congress regarding health plan compliance and enforcement. And then a uh, very interesting, but by January of 2028, um, and this seems to me that some people who currently publish reports about comparing rates across the country, they might have a federal report that would replace the work they're doing, um, but they would actually have to uh, identify and assess differences in negotiated rates across urban versus rural areas, individual small group and large group markets, consolidated, unconsolidated healthcare provider areas, nonprofit versus for-profit hospitals, nonprofit versus for-profit insurers, and those insurers that serve only a local market versus those that um, serve a national market or a multi-state market. That will be good reading. Four and a half years. I'm already on the on the wait list, right? Absolutely. Eight that will hold the same year. Good reading. Um, so. Now, that was the easy part of this discussion, is the changes to transparency that are included in the legislation, but let's make life even more difficult for hospitals in particular. First of all, this is provider-based status. You know that a lot of providers have off-campus provider-based departments. What you would be required to do under this um, um, Bill, uh, by January 1 of 2026, is to attest for each of your off-campus departments that you are in compliance with the requirements that are the requirements and obligations of being a hospital. Um, in addition, and this is what really scares me, um, is that you are also going to have to obtain and begin to use a separate national provider identifier for each of these off-campus outpatient departments, at least as far as it go, as uh, billing government payers go. Um, don't know what other payers the health plans will do. Are they going to want to start contracting based upon each NPI? or how are they going to be contracting going forward. But CMS would be tasked with developing a process for you to obtain national provider identifiers for each of your off-campus departments. My question also goes to, what about the patient who visits, has services? Um, let's say I um, come into a clinic and I have a separate building, perhaps, that has the MRI, and the clinic sends me for the MRI. Am I generating two bills? What is this? And the lab, right? And, and the lab, et cetera. Um, how are we identifying all of these off-campus outpatient departments that we would be required to get NPIs for and bill separately? Yeah, Kathy, I think our best hope is that this is treated by the agency like appropriate use criteria, right? That, yes, we're supposed to create this regulation, but we don't want to. But That's true. We'll That's see what happens. True. We'll see, because it's going to be a lot of work for CMS, too, uh, to issue all of those NPIs. Um, but let's figure out where they're going to get some money to do some of these things. And we've had discussions in the past about site neutral. We're going to touch in a minute 
on what MedPAC has proposed um, that will be in their report that comes out um, tomorrow, I guess. Today's the 14th. Their, their June report comes out on the 15th. But let's start implementing site-neutral payments under this bill for drug administration services. They are the focus of this particular provision. They are for drug administration that is provided in a hospital outpatient department. We'll talk about what those are in a minute. Um, they would be, um, the payment for those services would be lowered to the payment rate in a physician's office as opposed to a hospital outpatient department. So it, it, uh, assume similar to some other off off site services, it would take the um, HOPD rate and lower it to 40%. That is the current reduction that you get for those services that were not grandfathered. They would be eliminating, as it, as it applies to these drug administration services, the issue of grandfathered or mid-build. Remember, we had this requirement that if the hospital outpatient department that was off campus was in existence um, as of November 2nd, 2015, or was in a mid-build situation, that you were exempted from the redu reduced rate. Under this, propo this le proposed um, legislation, um, what you would be dealing with is, is it doesn't matter if you existed back in November of 2015, you would have a lower payment rate for drug administration. Now, I know a lot of providers have created infusion centers um, that are off campus. They are convenient for patients to go um, to receive um, drug administration services. Uh, recognize that this would impact all of those facilities in terms of um, the service, the payment rates. Um, this, uh, based upon the current legislation, um, there would be a four four year phase in with full implementation by January of 2028. The American Hospital Association believes that just this drug administration service alone reduction would cost hospitals over $3 billion in 10 years. And um, any budget neutrality adjustments would not take into consideration um, the savings. So essentially, this would be done in a non-budget neutral manner. Um, you are not going to get paid more for something else when you're getting a reduced payment for the drugs. Marty, any comments on that one? Uh, I'm just terrified to see what's in the proposed ops rule and see what CMS is already up to on site neutral payments, but that's another story and we'll talk about that soon enough. Yes, MedPAC site neutral uh, proposal essentially is looking at um, um, a, a requirement, and we'll see if Congress adopts this one. They actually, there was a bill on this in the precursor to 3561, there was a bill that went full force on site neutral. The 3561 only addresses drug administration, but who knows what happens by the time this gets through the full house and into the Senate. Um, but the proposal that MedPAC has recommended is first of all, that every year CMS would be um, tasked with identifying those services that um, could only be provided in a hospital outpatient department and any discussion of site neutrality would not apply to those services. Um, they would also be tasked with creating comprehensive APCs, ambulatory payment classifications for emergency services, critical care and trauma visits. In other words, rather than being paid for multiple services as it relates to a patient in the emergency department, there would be a comprehensive APC that would cover the en entire encounter. So that um, would be a new uh, payment billing issue. For all other services that were not emergency critical care trauma and that were not on that list of services that CMS can own, says can only be provided in a hospital outpatient department, there will be a study done. If hospital outpatients um, represent the highest volume of those services delivered, 
We're looking at ambulatory surgical centers, physician offices, and hospital outpatient departments. If the hospital had the highest volume, services would be continued to be paid under OPPS to the hospital, not to anyone else, but to the hospital. If ASCs had the highest volume, the hospital and the ASC would be paid at the ASC rate. And if physician offices and non-grandfathered outpatient departments had the highest volume, then the hospital and the ASC would be paid the weighted average of the difference between the physician, facility, and non-facility rates. So this is scary because first of all, you are not, you're billing it as a hospital claim. You're billing it on a UB or the, its uh, electronic equivalent and it's capturing this information. And right now CMS is using a substitute of taking OPPS minus 60% to pay you for those um, non-grandfathered off-campus services. This would be actually doing a weighted average between the physician fee schedule facility and non-facility rates. So a lot of work on CMS's part as well. And again, not in any current running legislation. Um, and just FYI, I think AHA put the price tag on this at 180 billion. Right. Um, that's versus the three billion for drug administration. Okay. Kathy? Uh, yes. Um oh, next, we got a little bit of good information, good news. Um, if this ultimately passes. Um, but this we recognize that from a Medicaid disproportionate share perspective, we are looking um to um the potential for an eight billion dollar cut in Medicaid dish um as of October of this year. Um, what so far we've always had this again pushed down the road. Uh, essentially what we're looking at is under this legislation it would again be pushed down the road to fiscal year 2026. They need to act on this fast otherwise we're going to be looking at um, an issue. Uh, last but not least for me is mandatory reporting of ownership information. Um, Beginning in January of 2025, if this becomes law, certain entities and that uh, those entities are hospitals, physician-owned practices with 25 physicians or more, um, physician practices owned by a hospital health plan, private equity company, or venture capital firm, ambulatory surgical centers, and freestanding EDs, they would be required to report annually on their business structure, any mergers, acquisitions, changes in ownership. Failure to report if it's a hospital with 30 beds or more, um, it would be a $5 million hit um, um, for each report not provided and all other entities, we'd be looking at $2 million. Um, specific to hospitals on the next slide, in terms of um, what you would be required to report, um, in addition to the issues about ownership and things like that, you would be required to report your debt to earnings ratio, your average amount of debt incurred by the hospital, as well as the overall entity, uh, any real estate leases and purchases. And for non-hospital, uh, non-profit hospitals uh, in particular, any capital gains invest investments and disaggregated by type of investment and the taxes paid on these gains. And that would all be made uh, public uh, by HHS by January of 27. Uh, Marty. Beyond, beyond 3561, another bill that passed out of Energy and Commerce is 3290 with regard to the 340B program. This passed on a more party line vote, as you can see. Um, but here, I mean, this legislation is really intended to say that the discounts that hospitals enjoy or other covered entities enjoy under 340B should be to the benefit of the patient as opposed to the benefit of the provider, which I think is inconsistent with really what 340B was intended to accomplish, which is to provide support for covered entities through the drug discount program. So as you'll see, there are a number of reporting requirements that are um, in this legislation to hold covered entities accountable to both discounts they've received, how they use those discount dollars, and then how that is benefiting different types of providers. There's a whole lot more going on on 340B. There's a proposed reg that's sitting at OMB uh, that 
concerns how we would allocate dollars following the Supreme Court decision on 340B. Kathy and I certainly have 340B on the list for a more comprehensive webinar, mainly because we let the 340B experts talk about that as opposed to us. Last but not least, at least in my heart, um, what's going on in rural health? The Senate Finance Committee conducted two full day hearings on rural health care in May. Uh, which went into some pretty great detail on the challenges facing rural providers. And there's just a whole slew of bills pending now in Congress that would address rural health. All, none of these have made it out of committee yet, but what I'm watching very closely is the Rural Hospital Closure Relief Act, which would open back up COD designations based on necessary provider status as opposed to distance, uh, which certainly could be some significant relief to some rural, rural PPS hospitals, but much more legislation going on there to keep attention to. Finally, we'll be back on June 28th, uh, shortly before uh, the 4th of July holiday, to discuss proposed rules. Um, everyone's sitting. What? We hope we're going to be talking we about hope we are. Everything's sitting at OMB right now. Nothing's been released yet, but we know we have fee schedule, hospital outpatient department. We've got home health agencies. We've got ESRD. What am I forgetting, Kathy? But they're the all there. The 340B. Right. So, um, and the nursing home uh, staffing requirements are yes. also there as well. So we will certainly be talking about some proposed rule, which most likely I'm certain they're going to release on June 27th, knowing our luck, but we're hoping that you'll be able to join us then. Thanks once again to Brian and Don for joining us and hope you have a great day. Be sure to apply your flag today. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at pyapc.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Hey!